All right, guys, welcome to another episode of The Report. Today, we are back in the studio here in downtown San Diego, and we got another Beers and Deals meetup tonight down here in San Diego. So super excited about that, but more excited about our guest today. We got two very special guests. They have actually do a lot of creative financing. They actually just uh, funded a loan, a creative loan on one of our boutique hotel deals. And uh, yeah, just had the pleasure to have dinner with you guys uh, last week and uh, super excited that you guys are here. I got Todd Stickler and Paul Cortez. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for, for having, having us. us. Yeah, yeah. Appreciate you guys coming down. Um, you know, I was actually surprised before we started recording tonight uh, that you guys, 10% of your lending portfolio is in real estate. I would have thought it was much more, but it's only 10%. And you guys do a lot of creative financing for uh, businesses and in all different industries. Um, I saw you guys are doing a deal in, in the aircraft rental space. Um, but tell me a little bit about what you guys do uh, in the lending space today as a whole. Yeah, so LendSpark uh, Corporation was built to work with businesses to provide them the different capital needs that they have um, where it wouldn't be just a one-size-fits-all solution. So we like companies that are growing, that need growth capital, where maybe banks aren't going to be lending in the future to them. We like companies that maybe take on some new contracts, so they need some working capital to get going in the fields, or uh, companies that maybe have had some ups and downs in the financials, Banks may not love them, but they're still good companies. They're still growing companies. They're still very viable, and we can provide that working capital to them. Yeah. And so uh, you guys do, is it typically short-term financing, or do you guys do some mid midterm stuff as well? We'll do some uh, midterm stuff, but our average deals are around 12 months. Okay. And we can renew those so that it almost becomes a kind of a line of credit in some respects. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. And are you guys in all states, or is it, is it mostly California-based stuff? We are in all states. The majority of our portfolio is in California, Texas, Florida, uh, some of those areas, just because of the number of businesses that are in those areas. Sure. So we are in a high interest rate environment right now. You know, the Fed has all the control with the interest rates. Um, and it's, you know, it's shifting a lot of ways that a lot of things are done in the commercial real estate space. Um, obviously, small business as well. Um, how is the high interest rate environment affecting your guys' industry? Well, in many ways, it's getting uh, busier for us. Um, the We've never been the cheapest rates out there, right? I tell everybody, if you can get a bank loan, run, don't walk to the bank. Outside of the bank, then really, what is it that you're looking for? If you want equity, there's equity pieces out there for you. But if you don't want equity and you want debt, it's going to be a little bit more expensive. So um, obviously, our cost of capital goes up with everybody else's. And so it does impact ultimately the borrower. But it but at the same time, we're seeing a tremendous amount of new volume come in the door just because of what's happening in the lending environment. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I can attest to this. I think 18 months ago, the environment was much different. It was a lot easier to go and get creative finance uh, financing. Um, but today, a lot of those options have dried up um, because of all the volatility in the marketplace. And so, you know, I was, I was just hanging out with some other bridge lenders that we have up in Northern uh, California. And... You know, they're saying, hey, like, we've never had this much demand for our product right now because of the, the rate environment. And so, you know, it's interesting, you know, when, when, when times like this tighten, um, you know, a lot of money gets sucked out of the economy. But then it provides, you know, opportunity for a lot of folks like you guys and a lot of private financing options and that sort of thing. You know, when you guys are financing these business deals, what, what are you guys typically looking for? Is it, is it more so the relationship of the operator um, and the investor or the, the entrepreneur, or is it more so the industry that you guys are investing in? There's a lot of different things to look at with any kind of lending. But at the end of the day, with the first question I always ask is, why do they need our money? Right? If, if they're coming to us, it's a little bit higher cost of capital. So what, what's the purpose of the funds going to be used for, which is vital question for us to get answered. We do look at industries or certain industries that have fluctuations in the marketplace. Transportation's one right now where mm. it's taking a pretty big hit. Um, two, two, two and a half years ago it was on fire, right? You couldn't find a truck or a trailer or anywhere, um, but that's taking a hit. Uh, smaller construction is taking a big hit right now. So we like the bigger contractors, the heavier construction. So why do they need our money? What industry are they in? How's that industry being impacted in the economy today? And then again, what kind of ownership structure is in place? Who's running the company? What does their future contracts look like? So we really do dig in, 
But at the end of the day, we want to partner with them because we want to understand not only why do you need our money, but how can we help you achieve the goals you want to achieve? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I think, you know, at least when we go get permanent financing for the real estate stuff, you know, on the commercial side, they're looking, looking for a couple of things. They're looking for the experience of the operator and what's their track record, what's their schedule of real estate owned. And then also they're looking at the asset, like how well does this asset underwrite? Is this an asset that we want to invest our money in? Now on the residential side, uh, you know, I feel like it's completely different, mm -hmm. right? You know, you go and get a, a residential loan for a single family home that you're going to live in here in Carlsbad, California, for example. Uh, they're going to be looking at strictly your credit score as a borrower and your debt to income ratio. Right. And they don't really care about anything else other than the, the property appraising. Um, and so outside of that, it's like it's a whole different, you know, ball game and, and kind of understanding the commercial stuff. You know, the commercial stuff, it's like it's hard to get commercial loans if you don't have the experience, mm -hmm. you know, and you got to leverage other people's experience. They don't care about your debt to income ratio. Right. Um, and often you're getting these loans under an, an entity or an LLC, not your personal. So uh, there's a lot of differences there. Um, so it's it's definitely unique to kind of hear how you guys uh, spin it. Now, uh, how are you guys funding these loans? Um, obviously, I know you guys are using some of your own funds. You guys are bringing in investor capital. Kind of tell me what that capital stack kind of looks like for you guys when you guys fund these deals. Yeah, so at the end of the day, we have our own um, financing in place. So we get warehouse facilities. Um, and in addition to that, we've developed a... What do, you, what do you mean when you say warehouse facilities? So a warehouse facility would be from a bank or from another lender that would provide me capital that then I can go lend out to customers. I've never heard that term before. Yeah. It's called where, warehouse facilities. So it's similar in mortgage. It's similar in other kinds of lending spaces where... Mm -hmm. Um, sometimes banks won't lend to me directly or they may not lend to you directly, but they'll lend to me and then I lend to you. Yeah. So they're called warehouse facilities. Okay. So I'm the re one responsible for the warehouse facility so that it's uh, incumbent on me to make sure I'm choosing the right borrowers to work with. Mm. In addition to, so when we talk about the interest rate environment, my cost of capital to borrow funds goes up as it well. It has also gone up. Right? Okay. So um, we're all in the same you know, we're all in the same place right now when we're dealing with interest rates. Uh, in addition to that, we've developed a financial technology that allows for platforms that investors can invest with us alongside us on the deals. Okay. So we have high net worth, we have institutional funding that will um, rely on us to do the underwriting, do the servicing, but they want to invest their capital alongside us in each of these different um, borrowings. Is that when you guys bring investors into this deal, is it is it typically cheaper or more expensive than your your warehouse funding options? It's no cost to me. So they they effectively come alongside us and invest alongside us. Okay. So um, doesn't cost me money, and it doesn't cost the borrower anything differently. They're just a uh, let's call it a portion of each loan. Gotcha. But you got to give the investor some sort of return, right? And are you are you typically taking a, a spread off of that? The investor will get the similar return that we get less okay. our, our um, management fees. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. So, and in addition to that, we also uh, started a fund where we created our own fund, raised capital. We treat that very similar to, as we do our warehouse facilities. And we're looking to raise fund too as well. So I love that. Yeah. So tell me about this fund. Uh, we started our boutique hotel fund earlier this year. Um, so I'm a little bit familiar with with how these funds work on the real estate side. Um, but on this on this end, I'm not too familiar. So tell me a little bit about how you structured your fund. So there's two different ways to structure the fund. One could be a straight debt fund where you charge or you pay a, a flat rate to the investor for a period of time it could be 12, 36 months. It could be a lockup period, depending upon what you're looking to do. And then you have a certain term structure on how they can get out, whether it's a 90 days or et cetera. Um, the other way to do that is to create a fund where you charge a, like a two and 20, like a hedge fund. So you charge a management fee and then you charge a success fee. Um, and so the whole structure and the whole goal that I've set up in, in Linspark with my partners and I, is that we don't want our investors kind of picking and choosing every deal. Mm. What we want them to be in is in all of our deals, because then effectively we're creating a mutual fund of deals. If a couple do go bad, then they have multiple others that are performing well. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I think that's always one of the benefits of the fund, whether it's on, on the capital side or, you know, in our case, the hotel side. It's like now these investors don't need to pick and choose which deals to participate in and which mm -hmm. deals to sit out in. 
and they get to benefit from the diversification, which mm -hmm. one takes risk off the table, um, but two provides you know some sort of blended return that's you know um, going to hopefully be in the green, right? right? Depending on what you're investing in. But um, I think that's pretty cool. Uh, how many on average? Like, so you're about to create the second fund. The first fund, on average, how many deals are these investors participating in? Ballpark. 150, 200. Wow. Okay. Yeah. We turn the money about three times a year. Okay. And um, they, you know, again, every fund can be structured differently depending upon what the parameters of the limited partnership agreement state. So if I create a fund that says, all right, I'm just going to charge you 12% for your money, then I just pay either monthly or quarterly for them to to have access to their financing. Okay. Gotcha. If they are part of the hedge fund structure, then I could pay out a quarterly kind of dividend payment. I can pay out an annual dividend payment. There's a lot of different ways. But at the end of the day, the most important thing for any investor is who are you investing with? What's their track record? Mm -hmm. How knowledgeable are they in this space? Tell me about all the bad deals that have happened. That's yeah. what I want to know about. Like, what deals went wrong? What did you learn from them? How did you get out? If you love real estate investing, passive income, and tax benefits, but don't have the time, my company, Summers Capital, is buying boutique hotels right now. We source the deals, we renovate the properties, and we even handle all the day-to-day -day management, making it truly hands-off for our investors. If you want to learn more to see if we can help you, visit summerscapital.com slash invest to book a call with our team. Again, that's summerscapital.com slash invest. Now back to the show. Yeah. So speaking of bad deals, you know, obviously it's, it's part of the industry. Um, you're never going to be 100%, especially if you're doing the same volume mm -hmm. that you guys are doing. I know our other bridge lender um, that we're actually buying a deal from up in uh, Washington right now, um, they were down here touring uh, and doing a final walkthrough with the hotel down here in Lit Italy that we're about to bring online. And they alluded to a deal that they're taking back from a borrower, brand new construction. The developer uh, was not a hotel operator, stopped making the debt service payments, um, wasn't making any debt service payments at all. And so they think that this borrower was actually pocketing uh, any revenue that right. was coming in um, because this borrower knew that, that he was going to uh, f get foreclosed on. And so anyways, we have an opportunity now to come pick up this property for 73% of the appraised value. Um, there's no renovation that's needed. There's no furnishing or design that's needed. It's literally brand new and turnkey. But our value add component is this, that we're getting a 27% discount, right? And so we just need to, you know, bring in some good marketing, bring in some good operations, stabilize the property, and then we'll refinance some permanent debt. They're going to finance it for us, which is great. Now, their default rate portfolio wide, and they're in all 50 states, they said it was 1%. Mm -hmm. Now it's creeping up to about 2% because of the rate environment that we're in. What is your default rate portfolio wide? And, and how do you treat these, these borrowers that, that, you know, maybe start, they stop making their payments? All default rates are always going to be higher than the banks or even some of the real estate lenders just because of the fact that there's usually longer term financing, lower cost financing. When you have a shorter term kind of bridge lending that we do, a little higher rate, our our default rates are kind of in the 4% range, kind of okay. you know, single digit still. At the end of the day, what we want to do with our customers is find any way we can to work them out. We didn't get into this industry at all to- take, You don't want to take back the asset. We don't want to take back the asset. Yeah. I don't want to put people out of business. That's not my That's not my yeah. goal. We are we really look at ourselves as investors in the companies. I like that. We're providing debt, but yet we're investing in them side by side. So look, businesses get in trouble. There's ups and downs. There's things that happen that we can't control. A hurricane may come through in the Southeast. Yep. Uh, you know, COVID could hit, those things, and we want to work with them. So. The majority of the things that happen when they get into, quote, a default is we want to figure out what's the workout situation for us. Now, um, if we can't get there, then clearly we have to use the court systems to assist us to um, find a way to get our money back. Yeah. Um, and so every now and then, unfortunately, you, you, I'm sure you have to take back assets, mm -hmm. take back properties. But what is it like when you take back a non-real estate asset? You, you're taking back the business or like what, what's the real collateral there? So that's, that's, again, what I, you know, I want to kind of hit on from Linspark's perspective is, you know, there's so many different types of financing in the marketplace, sure. right? You got, we're not a startup lender. So there's guys that will do startup financing. There are guys that will do, I think you had somebody on the show that did the 0% credit card stuff. Yeah, for the startups, king of debt, right? Jack, Jack McCall. Right. We won't do that kind of stuff. But um, once you get into two plus years time in business, you have some ongoing revenues. We can look at accounts receivables. We can look at equipment. We can look at real estate. 
We can look at inventory. And so at the end of the day, when we're underwriting, not only what the needs for use of funds are, we're also taking a look at what's the collateral. So mm. to answer your question, as an example, equipment, if we take collateral, uh, equipment as collateral, um, if they default, then typically we're having to work through how do we get get to that asset. Sure. Um, if it's a friendly relationship, we can go get the asset, get it uh, either sold directly from the borrower to somebody. Got it. Maybe we turn it over to a vendor or an auction house and we can get our money back there. Got if it. If it gets contentious, then we have to send a third party to go recover the asset. So would you say most of the business financing you guys are doing uh, is cross-collateralized with hard assets yeah. that that individual owns? Mm -hmm. So if that individual owns a property... You guys will cross it if, as long as there's equity in the, in the in that property. You'll cross it with one or two of those properties. And yeah, that's everything's your, that's business your purpose, business use. Okay, got for, it for that, funding. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, what, what's like the craziest like deal that you guys ever had to take back? <laughs> craziest deal? I'm just curious. Well, we've had one customer that was federally indicted, so we mm. got a subpoena from the Department of Justice, and. Um, Unfortunately, they put themselves in some bad situations legally. Mm. Um, and without getting into the specifics, they had a lot of collateral. We had a lot of collateral that was equipment. So we had to work with the federal government to get access to the equipment to take it back. Wow. What kind of equipment are we talking? Like construction equipment? Uh, in that situation, it could have been, um, you know, shredders, CNC machines, uh, heavy, heavy pieces of equipment for manufacturing. Gotcha. So you guys... Finally got the equipment back, and then you guys sold it. And then it. we take it to auction and sell and it and get our, okay. our money back. But you're not trying to do that kind of stuff, right? That seems like a lot of work to me. We don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. not why we got into this business. Yeah. I, I, and I'm not in the recovery business. Yeah. I'm so, in, yeah, in the business of helping people grow. So speaking of uh, how you guys got into the business, I'm curious. Like, how did you guys – I know you've been doing it for quite some time. We got my man Paul over here. You guys been working <laughs> together for how long now? We've been working together almost six years now. Six years, sure. yes. So, uh, like – what were you doing before this? And like, how did you even get into this business, Todd? I've always been in real estate in one form or another for my whole career. Mm -hmm. um, San Diego State graduate in finance. I got out. I worked as an analyst for a large uh, regional real estate developer. Uh, I worked for um, two or three regional developers. And then uh, I got into lending and um, on the uh, admin side. Okay. And then have just been in lending ever since. So I've been a little over 20 years now that I've been uh, in private lending, hard money lending, mm -hmm. uh, and love it. Get a little bit of everything. Um, you get the underwriting, get the origination, um, in the office, out of the office. Yeah. Get to meet a lot of different people. What, what's your key role within the, the company today? Paul. Today, Todd's got the overview of the entire company as the president and CEO. Mm -hmm. I work in the real estate division. Uh, okay. So I handle the real estate. So um, typically for real estate, um, we do our traditional first trust deed loans. Um, but uh, in addition to that, uh, as Todd had mentioned, you know, we've, we do the other working capital tied in with the real estate. So they do the business loan, let's call it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then he'll say, oh, they've got uh, some properties. Why don't we take a look at the property, see what we collateral is, how much, they, how much um, uh, value they're worth, what's our overall loan to values, and uh, to see if that's something that we want to uh, move forward with. Are you underwriting these deals as well? Yes. Okay. Yeah, the real estate portions. Yeah. No, I'm curious, like, what does what your guys' entire team look like, Paul? Is it, is it you know, obviously you're, you're doing the real estate stuff, um, and I'm sure you guys have a, a decent team, right? It's about 20 people on your mm -hmm. team. Is that right? Mm -hmm. What does the rest of your team look like? What, what kind of stuff are they doing? Yeah. So uh, we have kind of specialists within our organization. Okay. So we have a team of individuals that really understand equipment financing. So okay. what is the equipment um, asset? Is it a backhoe? Is it a mm -hmm. uh, boxing packaging machine, et cetera? And they will manage those deals. Um, Paul being the expert on real estate, he le leads that up. And then my business partner, Salman Vakil, and my new business partner, David Clark, and I are the real kind of credit committee, so to speak, on the big working capital deals. Okay, gotcha. Um, average deal size for you guys, loan, loan amount is what? About a million dollars. A million? Yeah. And then what is what about the high end? What, what, what's like a, a larger deal that you guys might do? We've gone up to close to $20 million. Okay. Yeah. Business or real estate? Um, that was real estate. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Do you guys feel better or do you guys feel 
less at risk when you're lending against real estate versus the businesses or the other way around? I think it really depends. Um, it doesn't have to be real estate for us, though we like it. I think mm -hmm. real estate was always the um, assumed very safe. Sure. But even with some deals that we've done on real estate, if the client files bankruptcy, I'm beholden to the BK Corp. Mm. And in one of our deals, it's been two years, we're still waiting. Mm. So is the asset great? Sure. But am I going to get paid back? anytime soon i'm not quite sure um, yeah. so the the answer to you is if it's a piece of equipment maybe i could have gotten it quicker um but at the end of the day fortunately the majority of our deals pay off right yeah. we have a pretty f low default rate for you know any, any of the listeners out there that are you know trying to get some creative financing and they want to work with some bridge lenders you know when you guys are introduced to a new borrower like what are some of the things that you're looking for to, to qualify that borrower outside of the ones we spoke of right. outside of the credit score and that's that kind of stuff i mean that's important right because right. because no one really knows they know to go to the bank and when the bank says no or maybe the bank says maybe but they never say yes mm -hmm. where do you turn to and there's a lot of people that will have like i said the one size fits all solution which is fine right they're experts in the um real estate bridge lending maybe they're experts in factoring what we try and do with our borrowers to really understand, okay, where have you been? Who yeah. have you talked to? Um, why did the bank say no or maybe? Mm -hmm. um, have you talked to other people? What is the best solution for you rather than just saying, hey, here's a deal for you? Sure. Um, I caution everybody, though, going online and just filling out applications leads into some unique situations where your information gets out there, just like going to an online mortgage and putting your application out there, you're mm. going to get a lot of calls from different people, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, what, what are some tips maybe like a borrower out there can do to position themselves from a place of strength to give them the best chance to secure some creative financing from lenders like you guys or maybe other bridge lenders out there? Yeah. So being in the specialty finance space, think about us no differently than a bank, right? I tell everybody, make sure you have a really good um good financial statements that are in place. If you don't get them audited, which is fine, um, make sure you have a strong CFO or a third party CFO or an accountant that can do those things. I can't tell you how many times we see people that just don't have organized financials. Mm -hmm. The second piece will be, you know, have you borrowed before? What's your past borrowing history like? So everyone looks at personal credit on a, on a consumer mortgage loan. We still look at personal credit too because it tells us about the character of the borrower. Yeah. Um, so, you know, make sure you have clean credit, not just clean credit and a high score, but the ability that demonstrate that you've borrowed before on a commercial basis mm -hmm. of some sort and paid back. Um, ha have a clear understanding of how much you need and why you need it. So many people say, Oh, I need I need a million dollars. Well, I need it. Well, I got this idea that's coming up. That that's not yeah. a good way to get financing. So it's much healthier if you come to us either from a trusted third party or from a bank or from an attorney and say, okay, I need a million dollars because I have a brand new contract with SDG&E mm -hmm. and I have the ability to generate X amount of money off it and it's going to get me launched on that job. Yeah, I love all that. Hey guys, real quick, the only way this show grows, the only way we continue to bring on bigger and better guests is if you guys rate, review, and share the show. So if you could take two seconds or the click of the thumb to review on Apple or Spotify, it will mean the world to me. But more importantly, we'll be able to reach more entrepreneurs and more real estate investors and help them build wealth through this podcast. Now back to the show. Um, one of the things that, that we do um, is, you know, if we're trying to get a, a deal financed or maybe a, a refi done on a particular asset, we'll actually put together like a five or six page deck with photos and kind of description of the, the business plan um, and kind of like really paint the picture of what we're trying to do. And I didn't do this with you guys, but I, I've done this before um, to where I actually go on like Vimeo and record like a five minute video, just really explaining like high level, like what the business plan is, why I like this asset, why I feel like we're getting a good deal and kind of really paint the picture. Um, but it also allows me to kind of get my my personality out there a little bit mm -hmm. um, and I'll record it. We'll, we'll send the link. We'll send the, the pitch deck to the, the, the lenders out there. And um, I don't know if they watch it. I don't know if it helps, mm -hmm. but uh, that's one thing that, that I've done in the past. And I feel like that does help out a little bit. Yeah. Look, think of me again as an investor, right? We're mm -hmm. putting money into your company. Yeah. It, it may be dead. It's not equity, but at the same time I want it back. So I want to make sure the person I'm lending to is going to be successful. So anything yeah. you can do to help me better understand what your vision is, why did you get into what you're doing? What makes you good at it? Why mm -hmm. have you been successful? 
If you've had some ups and downs, explain those because at the end of the day, all businesses go through cycles, right? Ups and downs. But if you can't explain why you lost a half million dollars last year, mm -hmm. we're going to have a hard time trying to figure out understanding how you think you're going to make a million dollars this year. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so that's on the borrowing side. So what about on the uh, investor side? Because you guys are always sourcing capital. You need capital to mm -hmm. fund these deals um, in order to grow your business. So uh, you alluded to the fact that you guys are about to launch a second fund. Uh, congrats, by the way. Thank you. What is that like on the investment side as an investor with you guys? What kind of return profile and terms can they expect? So on, on the low side, and Paul, chime in here because it's real estate. You know, if we're doing hard money real estate where it's a first trust deed, we're still kind of in that environment right now of 10 to 12% on good assets with mm -hmm. good borrowers. Would you agree yes. with that? Yeah, I yeah. agree with that. That's pretty competitive. Yeah, it's yeah. very competitive, right? And if we get into um, a deal maybe on the second side, you're going to be, you know, in the 12 to 18% kind mm -hmm. of range. When we get into the creative deals, right, the mm -hmm. ones that we're taking out sellers and we're maybe having, we're behind a first, um, those are times where they're going to be a little bit more expensive. Mm -hmm. And then when we get into the true business bridge loans, the risk profile goes up, so the returns are a little bit more. Um, but across the board, what I would tell the investors is if we're doing a real estate fund, which we're not doing right now, but we probably will fairly soon, then we're probably going to be shooting for that 10 to 12%. If we are looking for a true debt fund where we just want to borrow capital, we're probably going to be in the 12 to 14 percent, maybe 15 percent on the high side, which is still a very good return for some of these people that aren't finding that yield outside right now. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, when you guys launch the real estate fund, you know, you might pay the investor 10 to 12 percent. Mm -hmm. And then you mentioned you guys collect a management fee mm -hmm. and that's the only fee that you guys really collect. You guys don't take a spread off of. Sometimes we'll take 12. a spread off of that. Okay. Yeah. And, then, and But we'll work with the fund. It'll all be very, very documented. We spend yeah. a lot of time with attorneys. We spend a lot of money with attorneys Dude, setting up legal these, fees are not cheap, man. <laughs> these LP agreements yeah. so that we, uh, we spell it out for everybody so there's no questions whatsoever. Yeah, I love that. Um, the, the bridge lender that's selling us the Washington Teal, they have a, a REIT, um, and I think they pay their investors an 8% preferred return. And then anything above the eight, I believe they split 50-50. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of their their fee or their spread, if you would. Um, so I thought that was kind of unique. I would love to get 8% money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, shoot. I mean, our our investors, they like more of that mid-teen yeah. uh, average annualized return mm -hmm. with the tax benefits. So, you know, they're not going to pay. They can expect not to pay taxes on the cash flow while, while we hold these assets and then participate on any upside. Yeah. Right? And obviously you know, you guys are doing fixed returns and fixed debt. So it's a little bit more, I would say like a little bit more fixed, if you would, a little bit more secure, nothing's guaranteed. But, you know, on our end, right, this is all projections, right? So there's risk to it. Mm -hmm. But the good thing is real estate never goes to zero. Right. You know, and, and that's, you know, again, when we do our, our first fund, we've been north of 15% return to the investors by far. Mm -hmm. because we've been able to turn the money fairly quickly with the short-term duration of the deals. Sure. So as we're collecting the money, we're continually lending it out and allowing us to, um, what we call the velocity of capital, just keep compounding on itself. Yeah, what do they say? They say money money loves speed and, and wealth loves time. Right. So that that's, you know, so we've demonstrated it for us uh, and specifically for the first investors, they're all clamoring for the second one, right? There's two things you always have to be concerned about in terms of our space, or at least something that my partners and I concern myself with is we can go raise a bunch of money, but we want to make sure it's not sitting there. We want to be able to deploy it fairly quickly. Mm. So when you guys go and, and raise, will you, if you don't need the capital right away, will you, will you just basically not call it, you won't call that money until you have an opportunity for them? Yeah. So we'll go through a call period. We okay. may go through a six month call period where we do a call every month or maybe every th uh, three to six months. It allows people to also get a little bit more comfortable without putting up a million dollars if they're going to do that, and they can put it into tranches. Yeah, so they might they might test you out with like two fifty first mm -hmm. before they they start right. writing the larger. Yeah, our checks. minimum our minimum investment in fund two is going to be two fifty. Two fifty. Okay. When you first started, what was your minimum? We would take fifty. Okay. Yeah. And so over time, it's <laughs> yeah. gone up. It's yeah. gone up, and again, the performance has demonstrated itself. The investors speak very highly of us, and we've been very blessed with good investors. Yeah. No. Absolutely. 
And then do you guys do uh, monthly reporting to your investors? What do you guys do on the reporting side? Yeah, great question. Uh, we do provide monthly financials to them. So they get a, a, a financial package from our CFO. Um, if there's any questions, they have direct access to us that we can you know, get to. But fortunately, things have been working well where we don't get a lot of calls. On the real estate side, um, it's, you know, Paul's really interacting with them quite a bit, which... With the investors? With the investors, okay. correct. On a monthly basis, if okay. not more. Okay. Yeah. And that's what's made Paul very successful in the, in the space is not only does he have a really great approach on the underwriting side, but he has a really good approach with the investors, right? So he helps them understand it. A lot of times they'll drive together to go see the different uh, properties and it provides that extra level of trust that they see, not only about the performance that he's provided, but the fact that he wants to take the time to make sure they're comfortable with what they're investing in. Yeah, I love that. I, I think reporting goes a long way. We'll do monthly reporting um, on all of our assets. We'll do like photos, videos, uh, updates of all the renovations, how that's going, and then like high level numbers and like that occupancy revenue and that sort of thing, which is cool. Um, but like you said, I, I mean, it's good that you don't have a lot of investors calling asking questions <laughs> because when things are going good. Um, you know, you won't get a lot of that, which is yeah. Which and, is cool. and again, we we've done we've tried to be as forth coming as possible with all the financials, good and bad, right? Yeah. So even if we have some defaults and we have some write-offs, we make sure that they are aware of that, what's going on. A lot of times we'll, you know, um, put out an email to let them, you know, know, hey, here's what's coming up. Yeah. I think with the fund too, one of the things we've been growing so rapidly and so even in the, in the high interest rate environment, we're going to do over $200 million of financing this year. I think we can double that again next year. And um, that's just going to require us to be much better at providing different information to our investors, whether it's an investor deck, whether it's a, a annual get together and, and educating them on what we're doing, et cetera. Yeah. And, and maybe more content, more podcasts like this. Huh? Exactly. And we're great to be here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I love that. And you mentioned your, your daughter is, is helping you with uh, a lot of the content and yep. social media. I have twin daughters. Uh, one just graduated from TCU and one from Alabama. And the Alabama daughter is uh, helping us right now on content creation while the actor strike gets uh, resolved. Wow. I love that. And Paul, you got some daughters similar age, right? Uh, I do. I've got a daughter who is teaching uh, second grade at uh, wow. Ana Vista Casita. And, I love that. Um, I have another daughter's recent grad uh, biochemistry degree from Colorado State. Okay. Uh, will any of your guys' daughters uh, be following your guys' footsteps and getting into the capital markets? Uh, at this time, no. <laughs> no? Okay, okay. Uh, they may. I have, my other daughter's in grad school for speech-language pathology. What I'd like to do is introduce them to the investing piece of it. Yeah. So I've already created a small fund for them, which I'm showing them, hey, every time we do a deal, a small portion of your money is going in here. Here's how it yeah. works. Here's Ver the returns. Versus putting it into traditional methods such as Wall Street, 401k, et cetera, right? Right. So if I can if I can generate 20% returns for them, which we've been able to do in some respects, it's, you know, is it safer than Wall Street? I don't know. I don't know how yeah. safe it is at sometimes. Right. No, I mean, it's hard to control, right? Right. You know, um, and that's why I love real estate, especially commercial real estate gives us a lot more control um versus wall street to where it's like well what, what are you really investing your money into often right. it's just a ticker symbol right and that kind of brings us back to what you said before we may be at 10 percent on the current portfolio balance but we're taking more of a of a focus on real estate and as we roll out more money so that will really probably be more of a quarter to, to potentially half of our balance i love uh, that on our portfolio grant cardone was on and he calls uh he calls the stock market, he calls Wall Street the uh, the Wall Street casino. <laughs> he goes, he goes, until I own the casino, I ain't going, I ain't going to invest in the casino. Right. The casino always wins. Yeah. No, yeah. absolutely. Um, so how, how about the tax side? I'm curious. So with the, with the investors, do you guys do a K-1 at the end of each year for them? Yes. And it shows their gains for the entire year. Yeah. Um, are there any tax benefits with what you guys are doing? Uh, on the real estate side, the investors would get a 1099 to be interest income. Okay. Yeah. And is it? It's long-term capital gains. Is that what it's taxed at? Short term. So it's short-term capital gains. Oh, uh, because you guys are turning inside mm -hmm. a year, typically? Mm hmm Okay. Interesting. Interesting. That's that's good return, though. I mean, for any listeners out there that are looking for a good return like that um, and want their money back relatively quickly, um, that's amazing. But I can imagine, you know, a lot of your investors just keep rolling it, right? Well, again, we're not money managers, right? But yeah. the typical money manager is going to tell you to allocate your your um, 
diversify, diversify, play it safe. right? So we'll we'll be a piece of your diver diversification schedule. Yeah, maybe we're the ten or fifteen percent in alternative investment that you're looking to get mm. a little bit higher yield on. You want to go with you and provide some, you know, boutique hotel financing. That's sure. great. You want to go into the market right now and get some five, five and a half percent treasury bonds. Awesome. Um, we're going to be that slice. We're never going to take somebody who's like, hey, this is all I got. Yeah. Here's some money. So why do you guys think that, you know, uh, the school system and, and just society in general, I mean, you guys have daughters that, that you know, are, are at that age where they just went through the school system. How come, you know, society does not teach about alternative assets and investments? How come it's all mainstream stuff in your estimation? Look, I, I think that banks are so dominant and they should be because they provide such a good product to the customers that that's pretty much what's kind of explained in corporate finance programs. Mm -hmm. um, I think with the advent of hedge funds, not a lot of people probably understand what those are or what they're doing because there's so many different diversifications with that. Private equity is massive right now, right? But no one is really talking about those things. So um, alternative investment or what I would call private credit or specialty finance like mine, I don't know why they're not talking about it because yeah. that's we're the backbone of what's really driving a lot of what's going on in the economy for these small business, small, medium sized businesses. Yeah. Uh, you just mentioned private equity being huge right now. Um, you know, if you look out over the next seven years, our country is going to experience the greatest transfer of wealth in American history. We got 40 million baby boomers retiring and a lot of these boomers own a lot of these small businesses. Mm -hmm. And I feel like our school system does not even educate on that opportunity at all, which is a tremendous opportunity in my opinion. Yeah, I think it's a huge opportunity, not only in terms of how do we transfer some of that ownership to the younger generation, mm -hmm. um, and that needs to start a little bit earlier sometimes. And I think, you know, business owners, unfortunately, get themselves so involved daily and they're running around so hard trying to build their business. They're not looking 10 years out, which a transition can take five to 10 years. Mm -hmm. Not a lot of your guys behind you are going to have the financial wherewithal to write a check, to have you go sit on a beach. Yeah. Um, and then what happens? Do you sell to a third party? Do you sell to a private equity? What happens to the guys that have been alongside you the whole time? Yeah, no, absolutely. It's going to be interesting to see kind of how this next 48, uh, no, I don't say 48, 24 months plays out with in regards to the interest rate environment. We got a election year next year. I was just looking at the uh, the one year or the one month SOFR uh, curve and just kind of looking at some of the rates uh, along this curve over the next two, two and a half years. So it's interesting to see. Um, but a lot of these uh, groups are predicting uh, kind of SOFR to be in that this is mid 2026, so we're talking, you know, two and a half years out to kind of be in that 375, 395 range, um, plus the spread. So you're looking all in, borrowing around, I don't know, um, mid high high fours. Yeah, and so for high fours, four, low 75, 500 a day, somewhere around there. Yeah, high fours, low fives, mm -hmm. all in. Um, so we'll see. But what I'm curious for you guys being in the industry, where do you guys kind of see rates navigating over the next 24 months? Yeah, I think 24 months is kind of a long-term horizon for us. Uh, we look at probably in the next 6 to 12 months, we don't really see much changes happening in the interest rate yeah. environment. I think more importantly, what we're really seeing is, and I think I mentioned this to you before, we're starting to see a lot of news in the media about people that they have jobs, they have uh, wealth within their 401ks or in their real estate, but they're really struggling month to month just mm -hmm. with the cost of living, right? Sure. The, that working capital to keep us alive. And we're seeing the same thing in businesses. Businesses are strong, their employment's strong, but they're struggling finding that working capital. And as the banks figure out how this massive increase in interest rate affects them, they haven't been lending as much. And so we're starting to see a much stronger need for working capital in the marketplace. Yeah, absolutely. What about you, Paul? What, what's your interest rate prediction over the next uh, 12 to 24 months? I'm going to concur and it's going to stay uh, about the same. Um, mm -hmm. I think that a lot of the uh, real estate investors and, and buyers, um, as in your side, they're still, still going to find the deals. Uh, it's still going to be uh, a challenge to get traditional capital. Yeah. Uh, and so they're going to come to us. On, on our side, we're still seeing that, you know, there's competition out there. There's other private um, lenders out there. Uh, so while we're not at bank rates, we're at private rates. Uh, we're still not going to see a, a huge increase 
uh, because there still are a lot of, I'll say, traditional investors out there uh, seeking to place their funds uh, and are looking for a good return. Yeah, I mean, I think what you guys are doing and the service that you guys are providing the marketplace, you're you're addressing a, a huge need right now, um, especially since permanent financing options are, are tightening. Um, and it's allowing, you know, folks like us and other, you know, savvy real estate investors that are, you know, getting creative deals done, um, an opportunity to, to still get in these deals and, and capitalize on them. So I love what you guys are doing and, um, I appreciate you guys coming on the show. It's, it's been a pleasure to, uh, to not only work with you guys, but also, uh, you know, run a, run a podcast with you guys. So thank you. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah. It's been thank great. Thank you, Rich. Really appreciate uh, it. Of course. Um, and you guys are coming to the meetup tonight. Yep. So excited for you guys to experience little beers and deals. Yep. I am too. They're Todd Stickler and Paul Cortez. I'm Rich Summers. Listeners, thanks for tuning in. We'll see you in the next one. Peace. Peace.